as we get in the spirit. Let there be joy in our coming together. Let there be truth heard in the words we speak and the songs we sing. Let there be help and healing in our disharmony and despair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. May we be nurtured by the presence of the spirit. together as followers of Jesus we put love first we pause in this moment to be open to the presence of the spirit we breathe deep sensing the animating power of the miracle of life we delight in the joy of being alive, our souls at rest, wherever we go, wherever we are, the spirit is within us and around us. With gratitude and anticipation, we quiet ourselves in this here and now. Yes. 
God calls us to a ministry of love. Beloved, let us love one another. We are called to love our parents and our children, our friends and our neighbors. Love is from God. We are called to love the neighbor that hurt our feelings, the parent who is cruel, and the coworker who is selfish. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We are called to love even the people we cannot see, in homes long neglected, in war-torn countries, in places of poverty. Those who love God must love their sisters and brothers also. May we accept the call to participate in God's conspiracy of love. This is our prayer. We offer this time of quiet, bringing our whole selves in the name of the one who taught his first followers to pray the prayer we now sing together. everybody it's your youth leadership team and we're excited to be planning to go on a work team at the end of july up at the navajo nation and the four corners united methodist mission but we need your help we have to get there first and foremost and so our van is going to cost about 850 dollars gas is another 350 to 400 and we're going to need to eat while we're there. There'll be about 12 youth and adults, and we're figuring about 150 to $200 a day. Uh, Reverend Tweedy at Trip Rock has asked us to help with the cleaning at the Methodist Church. We also want to do some painting at the Methodist Church and the thrift shop. We also want money for ice cream for the youth and adults <laughs> along the trip. <laughs> 
Absolutely. We're really fortunate to be able to have accommodations there and a kitchen facility and bathrooms and everything at the Four Corners Methodist Mission. So that's covered, but we really need your help to uh, do all of the supplies and the other uh, essentials that make a work team work. So all you have to do is go to give.weputlovefirst.org and there's a youth missions line there and give generously so that we can help you and all of us put love first. Thanks for your support. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Be it online, on the phone, or in socially distanced expressions of service, the Fountains continues to touch the lives of thousands of people in real and practical ways. Your faithful and regular giving makes it possible. Thank you. You can help our efforts continue by giving electronically through several easy and secure methods. You can visit our secure website, weputlovefirst.org, and click the big blue donate button, or simply point your browser to give.weputlovefirst.org and you'll be taken straight to our secure giving page. You can download the Give Plus app on your mobile device, search for the fountains, and follow the instructions, or you can open the camera app on your phone or tablet and point it at the QR code right here on the screen. You'll then be able to go straight to our secure giving page to make a donation on your mobile device. And of course, you can always send a check. Again, thank you for helping support the fountains as we continue to work towards putting love first in the world. Your ongoing generosity not only helps reach real people with care and compassion, but helps cast the vision of that better world our hearts know is possible. Thank you. And 
In the chapters before our passage today, Paul is writing to the Romans with a list of what Christians should do to demonstrate what love is. Then, just for good measure, he switches over to what we shouldn't do as a demonstration of love. To do that, he uh, makes an appeal back to the list of our favorite shall nots, the Ten Commandments, and he writes, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment you can think of are all summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he hits us with our passage for today. Paul is basically saying what he says elsewhere, what Jesus said over and over, and what saints and mystics have been trying to get us to recognize from time immemorial. When you add up everything else, the law, the rules, the traditions, morals, everything, all you really need is love. That's it. You can't go wrong. If only Paul had actually met a real human being. Our words of wisdom are from Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Okay, fountains folks, say it with me. As followers of Jesus, we put love first. Woohoo! We're so convinced of love's importance at the fountains that it's even our URL, weputlovefirst.org. Wow, that's great! 
but do we really know what we're committing to? I think most of us have heard that there are different words in the Bible that are all translated as love. There's philia, or ordinary human affection, eros, or physical attraction, and agape, the unconditional gracious love we all aspire to. But I think we all know that there's a lot of subtlety we can often miss out on. This question was posed to a group of four to eight-year-olds. What does love mean? Chrissy, age six. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your French fries without making them give you any of theirs. Bobby, age seven. Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Nika, age six. If you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Lauren, age four. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. Billy, age four. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. <laughs> How do these children come by this wisdom? Are they adherents to strict religious practices? Do they hold to complex belief systems? Or are they young enough to have not been jaded yet by the system? Maybe they've been reading 19th century French philosophy. Stendhal wrote, Prayers for love will not generate love. Pleading for love will not evoke love. Preaching about love cannot net love. No Valentine greetings can perpetuate love. Only action, action alone can sow the seeds to reap the harvest of love. Action alone can reap the harvest of love. That's probably why you'll find what's come to be called the golden rule at the heart of Jesus' ethic of love. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Variations on this rule are found in virtually every religious tradition in the world. The great Rabbi Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow and added, this is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Islam's version is, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. As Americans are raised to believe in a zero-sum game that prioritizes winning over everything, Taoism's version may be the most challenging to American ears. Regard your neighbor's gain as your gain, and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. But despite all that persuasion to prioritize loving one another, even at our own expense, much of what passes for Christianity today emphasizes holiness over love. Instead of showing love and compassion toward others, Many Christian churches value purity of mind and body over all else and condemn those perceived by them to be sinners. The central religious issues for these Christians are correct belief, admission of sin and guilt, and the seeking of forgiveness, which, when you stop to think about it, is not really what Jesus modeled in his own life and teachings. The Jesus of the Gospels constantly irritates the religious people of his day by busting up correct beliefs. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. He hangs out with so-called sinners and totally shatters the rules of his day about who is worthy of forgiveness and who's not. Everything he does is based not on the rules, but on what the most compassionate, loving response would be at that moment. I, for one, am constantly being dinged by religious conservatives because, as they say, I'm not following the rules. I'm choosing the wide path that leads to damnation. 
Follow the narrow path, they say. Follow the narrow path. Well, what they're referring to is when Jesus talked about two alternative paths in life. One is narrow and difficult, the other wide and easy. And what these super religious people have done is interpret the narrow way as their path of correct beliefs and proper holy behavior. They tell one another that those with heretical beliefs or, or no belief and improper behavior that violates their absolute unchanging rules are on the wide path to perdition. But what if it's the other way around? What if the wide path is the path of conventional religion, of traditional churches that emphasize correct beliefs, rigid moral rules, and guaranteed eternal payoffs from God. Hey, join us. You don't have to think. Just follow the rules we tell you to follow. Hate the people we tell you to hate. And don't ask any questions. That would make the narrow path the much more difficult undertaking. A way rooted not in rules, but in the much more complicated ways of compassion, love, and doing justice. It's a path measured not by adherence to rigid standards, but by working out the way to be most compassionate in ever-changing contexts and situations. Which path sounds more difficult to you? The one that the vast majority of people unquestioningly follow? Or the one that demands the hard work of justice and love, even the love of one's enemy? I don't know if you remember after 9-11, a number of churches in Australia put up signs that read, Jesus loves Osama. The sign also included Jesus' quote from Matthew, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> it didn't make any difference. People's hair caught on fire, especially in the U.S. What? Outrageous! Obviously, Jesus is an American and hates Bin Laden, just like we do. That sign is a lie. Is it? Or is it just easier to dismiss Jesus as a naive dreamer when his call to love means changing your worldview? Whatever you think the definition of love is, Jesus' definition is harder. The conspiracy of love we've been talking about all these weeks is not based on a list of simple rules, and it's not easy. As Paul was saying when he quoted the Ten Commandments in order to dismiss them, you can impose all the laws you want on people, but in the final analysis, all you really need is love. But not just any love. It's a love that grows out of an understanding of a divine agenda for the world that includes the values of radical love and compassion. You can ditch all those rules. Genuine love is much harder than rules. Genuine love is a much narrower path than just following orders. Why? Because genuine love of neighbor is not a legal transaction to gain you your place in heaven. It's a relational interaction that perfects you as a human being and heals the world as we go along. <laughs> and I don't know if you've noticed, but as difficult as legal transactions can be, relational interactions are harder. In 1966, ethicist and Episcopal priest Joseph Fletcher wrote a book called Situation Ethics, The New Morality. In it, he rejected the idea of absolute morality and instead suggested staying flexible in each individual situation. The sole factor in making moral judgments in any situation? Love. He declared that sometimes traditional morality is not only not the same thing as doing what's right, traditional morality, the status quo, is sometimes a barrier to the good. Not convinced? Think about those good Christians who defended slavery as biblical. Think about those good Christians 
who stole Native American children from their families, cut their hair, gave them new names, and forbid them from speaking their native language. Think about those good Christians who right now are fighting to keep sex ed out of schools because they fear it will promote premarital sex. When every study shows that teaching kids about sex slashes the instances of STDs and teen pregnancies. How about those ethical dilemmas situations that you had to work through in school? Or, or stories like this one. A woman was imprisoned in a woman's POW camp and was, in all likelihood, destined to die there. She knew that her husband and children were frantically trying to rescue her, but had exhausted every option with no success. However, there was one way out of the camp, and that was to get pregnant. Pregnant women were considered a liability and transferred out of the camp to deliver their child in a hospital. The woman worked out a deal with a guard who was sympathetic to her situation and was willing to help. She became pregnant, was transferred, and escaped to be reunited with her family. She and her husband raised the child as their own, as her only motivation behind committing adultery was her love for her family and the dream of being reunited with them. As Fletcher says in his book, Sometimes you got to put your principles to one side and do the right thing. Fletcher's book ignited a firestorm of controversy. Why? Because the type of love Fletcher was calling for was outlandish. It was radical. And in the Bible, it's called agape. It's not a fleeting emotion. It's not a warm feeling of friendliness a condescending generosity, or a gentle tolerance of the shortcomings of others. In fact, agape is not a feeling at all. It's a verb that demonstrates love at its deepest level, in action and commitment. It is love that chooses to do what is best for another person, even when it may not go over well with religious people. Think of all the times Jesus upset the religious folks of his day by breaking all the purity rules, eating with tax collectors and prostitutes. Think of all the stories Jesus told where the heroes and sheroes were enemies of the Jews, or worse, women, unclean, who ruined everything by polluting flour with leaven, oh my, or some other unspeakable act. That's because Jesus' emphasis was on not only doing no wrong to a neighbor, but on loving that person. Because as Fletcher's scandalous situational ethic demanded, love is the only thing that is always good. Some of you will remember that back in 2014, our own Karen Bailey and Nelda Majors were the lead plaintiffs in the case against Arizona's ban on same-sex marriage. Then, on the day the ban was lifted, Karen and Nelda were the first same-sex couple to receive their marriage license in the state of Arizona. I was honored to be asked to officiate at their wedding, and because at the time, to do so was a fireable offense, I called Bishop Bob to let him know. You won't be surprised to know that he couldn't have been more encouraging and supportive. What you may not know is that Karen and Nelda invited Bishop Bob and his wife Greta to the wedding. And I remember later that night as I left the reception to rescue the babysitter, my last glimpse of the dance floor was of Bishop Bob and his wife Greta dancing the night away, surrounded by gay and lesbian couples. That's putting love in action. When Barack Obama quoted Martin Luther King Jr. in saying, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, he added, but it doesn't bend on its own. We are the shapers of the moral universe, and we bend that arc by loving our neighbor, by seeking justice for those neighbors who are excluded or who are at a cultural disadvantage. That's what Brother Cornell West means when he says, 
Justice is what love looks like in public. You simply can't talk about loving folk and not fight for justice. Fletcher believed, Paul preached, and Jesus demonstrated it in his life that the only absolute law was the norm of love. And all of them knew that this kind of love can't be legislated, it can't be commanded, it can only be called for, demonstrated, encouraged, and nourished, and will only be found on that narrow path that others may not understand, and in reality, may feel threatened by. So, as you seek to put love first, know that it won't be easy. If it is, you're probably not doing it right. And remember what six-year-old Nika said, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. In the meantime, remember these words of advice often attributed to Mother Teresa. If you can't do great things, do little things with great love. If you can't do them with great love, do them with a little love. And if you can't do them with a little love, do them anyway. Be well. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk. Other. We will walk hand in hand And together we'll spread the news That God is in our land And they'll know we are Christians By our love, by our love Yes, they'll know we are Christians By our love We will work with each other We will work side by side We will work with each other We will work side by side each other's dignity and save each other's pride and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Maker from whom all things come and all praise to Christ Jesus God's Holy One and all praise to the Spirit us all one and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes they'll know we are Christians by our love, yes they'll know we are Christians by our love. Hear these words of blessing as we go. Let us embrace the work and wonder of this day with fresh commitment. May we go forward together in the power of the love of God. In the company of Jesus Christ. And by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen.